So my name's Tom. I'm one of the clinical research fellows here at the OPDC. I've just started working with the group in the last couple of months. Uh, my background is as a neurology registrar here in Oxford. Um, and I'm really excited to be working with the group and to be working with many of you uh, over the next three years. So I'm going to be talking about sleep. And I think we all know that the answer to this question is yes. And what I'm going to do is tell you why I think sleep is important and to talk about one of the big problems that we have with dealing with sleep, um, not just in Parkinson's but in general, and some of the ways that we're going to try and use new technology to overcome those problems. Um, so this is um, going to be a project that's, um, well at the moment is in the very early stages, but I hope if uh, I see you again next year and the year after we'll be able to give you some progress updates on how it's going. So I'm going to start by just giving you three key headlines from scientific papers to, to suggest why I think sleep is important in Parkinson's. And first, and perhaps most importantly, is because people with Parkinson's tell us it's important. Um, some of you may recognise this study, uh, which is on the Parkinson's UK website, where people with Parkinson's came up with their priorities for what they thought research should be directed at and improving the quality of sleep was there in the top 10. So that's a good start, that's a good reason why we should be looking at sleep. So this is a bit of a more, more recent study in the journal Nature, and it's, there's some quite interesting ideas in here saying that perhaps sleep is not only a symptom of Parkinson's and indeed um, other neurodegenerative conditions, and the title here, amyloid, refers to Alzheimer's, but, but the article is, is talking about Parkinson's as well. Um, but in fact, perhaps having poor sleep might contribute to the disease and might make it worse. Um, and as such, if we can improve people's sleep, maybe that would protect the brain and slow down the course of the underlying disease process. So that's a pretty interesting and important idea. And finally, and this is what I'm particularly interested in, is sleep might tell us some really important things about the very earliest stages of Parkinson's. So there's this particular disorder called rapid eye movement sleep behaviour disorder, which you've heard about briefly already today. Um, and we know that lots of people with Parkinson's have this problem, but what we have also realised more recently um, is that many people develop this years before they're diagnosed with Parkinson's. And in fact, if you look at people who have the condition, but who don't have Parkinson's, they're at a very high risk of developing Parkinson's in the future, up to 80%, although it varies between studies. And so studying this condition can really tell us some very interesting things about the early stages of Parkinson's and help us identify people who are in those early stages. So I'll back, backtrack a little bit um, and tell you what REM sleep behaviour disorder is, and I'll, I'll refer to it as RBD from now on for... Um, brevity. And um, I've shown you three articles from esteemed medical journals, so I'm going to lower the tone now and show you something from the Daily Mail. Um, <laughs> but actually this is quite useful because this is how people present. They come to clinic and they say, usually the partner says, my husband, my wife is lashing out in, in sleep, seems to be acting out his dreams. Um, and the Daily Mail have provided a helpful cartoon of, of what they think that might look like. I'm going to give you a slightly more scientific explanation, but there's not too much science here. So this is a little diagram of sleep stages, normal sleep stages throughout the night. And as you can see, there's different stages of sleep, and as you come down, they become more, more deep. And you go through several cycles over the course of the night through these different stages of sleep. And the one at the top, which is labelled REM sleep, which is for rapid eye movements, is when a lot of your dreams occur. And in people without this condition, the brain is very effective at inhibiting the body from moving. And so you dream the dreams, but you don't act them out. In people with RBD, this mechanism is lost. And so when they're having the dreams, they act them out. And the dreams can often be quite violent and quite dramatic. And so it can lead to some quite um, disturbing behaviors um, in these people. So, why is this particular sleep disorder important? Well, I'll refer to some of the research that's already been done by the group here in Oxford. And this was a paper that some of you may have seen um, some time ago now, looking at REM sleep behavior disorder in people with Parkinson's disease. And it found that 
almost half of people with Parkinson's disease probably had this disorder and it was associated with reduced quality of life and that's really important and we don't know exactly why that is whether it's the sleep problem itself that causes that or whether this is a marker of a slightly different type of Parkinson's that's associated with other features but one thing that might contribute to reduced quality of life is the fact that this is under-recognised. So many of the people in the study didn't realise that they had this condition. And that's something that we see, and which I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, but we'd like to recognise this more simply because we can give treatments that will improve the symptoms um, and therefore improve quality of life um, for people with this condition. So why is it important from a research point of view? Well, as I mentioned before, this could be a way of looking at the very early stages of Parkinson's. And uh, Dr. Claire Mackay and her group have been doing some very interesting imaging studies um, to, to show that. And what you see here, this looks quite complicated, but actually it's, quite, it's actually quite simple. So what you see is the orange and yellow areas are a network of brain areas that are responsible for the movement problems in Parkinson's. So this is the area of the brain that goes wrong to cause the movement problems. And if you look at the top row, A, the areas in blue are the areas where this network malfunctions in people with Parkinson's disease. Okay, so it's right where we expect it to be. But what's interesting is if you look at row B, this is people with RBD, and they have the same problems there, even though they don't have the movement disorder. So this is a really interesting result because it suggests that with very sophisticated type of brain scan, although in fact it's a very straightforward scan to do, we can see some of these early changes even before people develop Parkinson's. And the key to that is that when we have medications that can slow the progression of disease, these would be ideal people to try those medications in because we could potentially even prevent them from developing symptoms. So what do I want to find out? Well, I'm interested in looking at which people with RBD will develop Parkinson's and, and when. Um, and that's something I'm working on at the moment. But what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this presentation is this next question, which seems quite straightforward on the surface of it. But in fact, it's not. We don't really know how many people have RBD, how many people are, are there out there who have this condition without knowing it. I think there's two important reasons for that. One is that most people don't know about it. Most doctors haven't heard of this condition, so it's unsurprising that most people in the general population haven't. And the second problem is that it's very difficult to diagnose accurately, and that's what I'm going to talk about next. So how do we detect it? Well, we do what's called a sleep study. The fancy name is polysomnography. And what this involves is bringing people into hospital, into a special room um, where they're wired up to all number of leads, measuring their brain activity, measuring their muscle activity, measuring their eye activity, and various other things. They have cameras on them um, all the time. And they stay in that room for two days and two nights, and we collect all of this data. And the advantages of this method are it's very accurate. I mean, you'd hope so with this many leads attached to you. Um, but there are some disadvantages too. I mean, some of them are obvious. This is time consuming, it's invasive, it's expensive, and for those reasons we can't roll it out to hundreds of people. In fact, we can only do ma maximum of two of these per week in Oxford. But actually, even if there weren't those time and money problems, it's also not an ideal study because it, you're bringing people into an unnatural environment. And people don't have the, you know, exactly the same sleep from night to night. So you don't know that you're necessarily getting a typical representation of what sleep is like. And I don't know about you, but I don't think I would have a particularly normal night's sleep if I was wired up to this many cables. The other problem with it is that it's a one-off measure. So we do it once. If we see the problem, great. If we don't, we don't. We, we can't then see how the condition changes over time because this is just a single diagnostic problem, um, um, intervention. So what do we use instead at the moment? Well, many of you will recognise this questionnaire, the RBD screening questionnaire, which is included in our um, um, questionnaires that, that are sent to participants in the discovery. And this has got some obvious advantages. It's very easy to administer. It doesn't take very long. It's quite cheap. 
But once you start to look at the questions, you realise some of the problems with this. So just take question number one. I sometimes have very vivid dreams. So yes, that is a feature of RBD, but lots of people have vivid dreams for all sorts of different reasons. So that's not really specific enough. I mean, look at question number four. I know that my arms or legs move when I sleep. Well, most people would probably say they don't really know what happens to them when they're asleep because they're asleep. And so it's not surprising that many people come to clinic with some of these boxes unfilled. So this is not accurate. And in fact, one recent study showed that in a series of people with Parkinson's disease, people who were positive on this questionnaire went on to have the full sleep study and only about one in three of them actually did have RBD. So this isn't accurate enough. So on the one hand, we've got a very accurate, very impractical test. And on the other hand, we've got a very practical, not very accurate test. And we want to find something in between. So how are we going to do that? Well, technology can help us, we think. And some of you will recognize this from the smartphone application that we're already using in our discovery clinics, which was developed by Max Little, who I think spoke at this event last year. And what this does is harness the technology that's already built into these mobile phones, in particular the movement sensors, and it uses them to detect the very subtle changes that we see um, in people with Parkinson's disease. And also it can detect subtle changes in people with REM sleep behaviour disorder as well. So this is, this is a promising tool. The trouble with a smartphone is that it's not that much use when you're asleep. So what can we do? Well, fortunately, Google and Apple have helped us out by developing these fancy new toys over the last few years. And although this may look like a toy watch that you might find in a Christmas cracker, it's actually a very high-tech bit of kit. And this has got all sorts of different sensors built into it. So it's got all of the same movement sensors that you've got in a smartphone. It can also monitor your heart rate. It's got microphones, which is important in RBD because as a feature of this condition, people often cry out in their sleep. So that's something we can record with these devices. And it's got various other sensors. And compared to the setup that you need to do a full sleep study, these are really cheap. So we think these can, develop, these can reliably identify many of the features um, of RBD. One of the things that they won't be able to do is measure your brainwave activity and tell us which stage of sleep you're in. So we're looking at a collaboration with some of our colleagues in the Institute of Biomedical Engineering using this little device. Um, and this is hot off the press, a photo that I took yesterday um, of this. And what this is, is a little strip of paper with some electrodes in. And it's upside down, but you can see that fits over the ear if it's the other way up. So all this does is just sits behind the ear and attaches to your skin, okay? And it's attached to this little box, which is about the size of a credit card with a, a longer cable than you can see in the picture. So that box will just sit on someone's chest. And that can give us a pretty good readout of the brain activity. We think this will be good enough to tell us which stage of sleep people are in and therefore we can identify when people are in REM sleep and then look at the watch to see what they're doing during, that, during those episodes. So I think the advantages of this over sleep studies are quite clear. Um, we can use this in people's homes, we can use it in much greater numbers than we can with sleep studies, it's relatively inexpensive and we think although it doesn't provide all of the information that you might get from a, um, a sleep study, we think it will give us what we want to know. So this is what we're looking at doing over the next few years. And in particular, the first thing we need to do is look at these devices and compare them to what we've got already. So we can compare them to people having sleep studies and hopefully show that these will detect the same things, but in an easier way and we'll compare them to the questionnaires and hopefully show that they do a better job than the questionnaires. Then what we want to do is, once we've shown that it works, use them on participants within the discovery project. We want to show that this works in Parkinson's disease, that this can identify this condition reliably in Parkinson's disease. And finally, this is perhaps further into the future, but what we'd ultimately like to do is use these tools to detect people who have got this condition who don't even know about it. And this is really gonna be key when, when we do develop treatments that can slow down the progression of disease. These people with RBD are gonna be people that we want to give these treatments to, but we need to identify them. 
So we need tools that can do that reliably on a large scale and, and um, cheaply. Um, and so we hope that this might be one tool that will help us to do that. So those are the aims. Um, come back next year, come back the year after and see how we're getting on. Thank you very much.